that reinvention really changed our relationship with our phone. So it was social media, and in particular, this focus on the social approval indicators that changed from being tools that we deploy occasionally into these constant companions that we're looking at all the time. Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 286. Jesse Chapp is here with Marty Wasserman, and we are here to take your health to the next level. Each week, we will bring you inspiring and informative conversations about health and wellness, covering topics of nutrition, lifestyle, fitness, mindset, and so much more. And this week, our featured guest is Cal Newport. He's an associate professor of computer science at Georgetown University. He's also a writer who focuses on the impact of technology on society. Cal is the author of six books, including most recently the New York Times bestselling book, Digital Minimalism, Choosing a Focused Life in a Noisy World. And this book is the focus of today's show. You won't find Cal on social media, but he's been blogging at calnewport.com for over a decade. This is such a great topic to bring onto the podcast. As so many times on the show, we've discussed different tips and strategies for reducing exposure to social media and our devices. But this time, what Cal's talking about is reevaluating your whole relationship with technology and how it's literally taking over our lives. And as Jesse said, you will not find him on social media. This guy has never had any of the platforms, so he is definitely a credible source. So here's what we get into today. We talk about how the Facebook like button has changed social media, planning analog time versus digital time, being intentional when you're using technology and how to use it productively, why anxiety is on the rise in adolescence, and how to dumb down your smartphone. So much great, practical, and useful information. Very excited for you guys to hear this. Here we go with Cal Newport. Hi, Cal. How are you? Welcome to the show. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you on the show, Cal. And the new book, Digital Minimalism, was an excellent read. We're going to get into everything digital minimalism today. And I want to start off by talking about something I read in the intro of your book, And you specify you're one of the few members of your generation to have never had a social media account, and you tend not to spend much time surfing the web. So you're 36 years old, same age as myself. What made you immune to these? Well, I've been trying to remember because it's been coming up a lot. So I do remember Facebook arriving on the scene. I think I was a senior in college at the time. I have vague memories of being a little bit mystified why people were so excited about it. One of the memories I have is that I never like ranking things. So I don't like saying like my favorite movie or what my favorite food is. For whatever reason, I always have a hard time with that. And that was a big part of Facebook profiles back then. So I think that played a role. Also, I was just an early internet enthusiast. So by the time Facebook came along, I had been hacking HTML and messing around with blog software for years and years. So it wasn't like it was offering something that I wasn't already doing on the existing internet. You explain in your book about your first impression with Facebook, and it was actually your wife now, girlfriend at the time, Julie, back in 2004 that introduced you to Facebook. So take us back there, and what were your initial thoughts? Well, her initial thoughts too. I mean, I went back and asked her about it. I mean, her memory, which I think a lot of people from back then share, is that it was sort of a triviality. You know, it was fun, but not something you would spend a lot of time on. Maybe you would go and see what's the relationship status of people that you had class with. Or, hey, can I find someone I knew from high school? Can I find what they're doing now? And you would explore a little bit, and that was about it. And then maybe you would occasionally check back in. So it was certainly not considered when it came out something that you would spend a lot of your day using. And that brings about the huge transformation in Facebook in 2009. And that's when the like button actually was invented and implemented into the system. So how did this change the game? Well, this was part of what was ended up being a pretty massive reinvention of the social media experience, which ended up reinventing our entire relationship with our phones. And so the like button was the beginning of this reinvention where social media became less about you post things, your friend posts things, and you read each other's posts. It changed from that into every time you log on, or then after that tap the app, you are going to see some accumulated social approval indicators. So a count of how many people like this thing you posted. What did people say about that thing? Did anyone tag you in a photo? Are you getting favorited? Are you getting retweeted? It became about this incoming stream of social approval indicators about you. The social media companies, starting with Facebook and then the other ones followed suit, really began to emphasize this stream of incoming social approval indicators because this is what got us to become compulsive users 
of the services. This is what got us from where we were in 2004, where it's, oh, last week I went on Facebook because I was bored. I want to see the relationship status, but I haven't been on it in days and into where we are today, which is 50 minutes a day of tapping again and again and again. Is there something new on here? Is there a new like? Did someone like something I did? Is there anything interesting for me to see? That reinvention really changed our relationship with our phone. So it was social media, and in particular, this focus on the social approval indicators that changed from being tools that we deploy occasionally into these constant companions that we're looking at all the time. And this brings about an interesting point for people like myself that have been on Facebook for a number of years, and how the platform has actually changed slowly but surely, or in some cases, like when the like button comes out, a pretty drastic change, but it's changed quite a bit from the initial program that we signed up for. Well, if you go back to the web context, when something like Facebook first emerged, this was the beginning of the web 2.0 movement, which is something that emerged after the original dot-com crash. So we had this enthusiasm in the late 90s, the original dot-com boom that was really focused on e-commerce. And the idea was it's much more efficient to sell things to people over the internet than in an actual store. And so we had all these high capitalized startups trying to sell all sorts of things to people. It was going to be this huge revolution. Most of those failed. In the 2000, 2001, there was a crash. Most of those failed. So what came up out of there was this social vision of the web, web 2.0, which is maybe the web is not just a cheaper way for people to buy things or a cheaper way for large media companies to deliver their content. Maybe the users themselves can contribute and post information. And this is when you start to get personal websites, GeoCities, AngelFire. This is when you start to get blogs begin to arise as a thing. And this was exciting. This was about expression. And so Facebook originally was, hey, let's take this Web 2.0 thing that's going on and we'll give you an even easier interface for doing it. So you don't have to buy a domain. You don't have to learn about WordPress. You can essentially have a blog. It will make it real easy for you to connect to the blogs of your friends. That was the original Facebook vision. What we have today is this completely different slot machine beast, which is about we will feed you information about yourself or that's statistically chosen to be hard to ignore. And we just want you looking at this thing, passively consuming what our algorithms select all day long. So it went from just let's make Web 2.0 a little bit easier into a completely different type of service. And I think a lot of people are unhappy with that change. Well, while we're on the topic of the like button, Let's talk about one of your recommendations for people that are going to use Facebook, and that's that people don't actually click that like button or comment on other people's posts. So let's get into why this is a recommendation of yours. Socializing on social media is, as far as your brain is concerned, really not real socializing. I mean, what we have evolved to crave is to actually be in the real world, sacrificing our time and attention on behalf of relationships that matter to us, actually having some friction. I had to get up. I had to go to your house. I'm giving up hours to be here. I'm sacrificing time and energy on your behalf to strengthen this relationship, to do this for your family, to do this for your close friends, to do this for members of your community. This is what makes us feel social. It's what makes us feel connected. It's what makes us feel sort of alive as humans. When you instead replace these type of difficult but meaningful interactions with these very low friction type online connections, such as clicking like or saying congrats with three you know, exclamation points under someone's Instagram post, or leaving a quick comment or retweeting a friend's thing. This is so lightweight and so low friction that we don't get nearly the same satisfaction. And so the problem is when we began to displace the valuable real world, analog, high friction social interactions that we crave with these low quality digital online interactions. And so when you do that replacement, it's a net loss. And it can lead you feeling lonely. It can lead you feeling miserable. It can push you into emotional areas that aren't that healthy. And so when I say don't click like or don't leave comments, what I'm trying to tell people is what you do on social media, don't try to convince yourself that's social. And the easiest way to do that is just really stop outside of just logistical things, really stop socializing that much on social media so that your human drive to be connected will drive you to do the hard stuff in the real world that you actually need. Yeah, for me, thinking about what you just said, it lets us off the hook. So saying congrats to somebody, a good friend of ours that just had a baby, or, you know, another example in that realm, it lets you put that check on the to do list and make it seem like you've already done something good. But it's just such a shallow interaction that, you know, it's just not very valuable. Yeah. I mean, instead of saying congrats, three exclamation points, you know, you should go to their house and bring them a box. And that box has survival stuff in it that they need as a new parent, right? And you take the time to do it. I went to the store. I bought this stuff. I came to your house. Here it is. I want to make your life better. 
that's a real connection. That actually strengthens a relationship. That makes both parties in that social connection right there feel much stronger about each other. The congrats with three exclamation points does about nothing as far as making your relationship feel stronger. As someone who's been an outsider of all these social media platforms, how have you gained interest in this and what allowed you to start to analyze this critically? Well, so as a computer scientist who also writes, I've been focusing in recent years really on unintentional or interesting consequences of technology and culture. And so back in 2016, I had published this book called Deep Work, which was in essence about some of the unintentional consequences of new technologies in the workplace. So in particular, what happened when things like email and Slack and related low friction communication tools came into the workplace. And the book is about how we lost our ability to concentrate and how this is a problem and how we need to rebuild it. So that book comes out and I'm on the road talking about it. And readers kept coming up to me and saying, okay, maybe I buy your premise about the impact of tech on the workplace, but what about the impact of tech in our personal life? Because there's something going on there that's becoming really distressing. And so I began to look more into it. And it really did seem to be a big problem. The forces at play seemed to be really different than what was happening in the workplaces. And I didn't see a lot of solutions out there that were working for people. And so over the last few years, it's something that I've become pretty involved in, in terms of my research and thinking about tech and culture. And what's the closest you've ever gotten to this addictive nature that you write about? Like, Is there anything that you've used or any tools that you've used that has allowed you to experience this? Like for me, for example... When we're near the trade deadline for Major League Baseball, I have to be very careful (laughs) because there's breaking news all throughout the day and you're waiting to hear about, you know, is my team going to make this particular trade or not make that trade, which is what I imagine online news is like for a lot of people all year round. But I learned, okay, I've got to be careful. Similarly, when I do book launches, I have to put pretty strict rules in the place. Don't go check sales ranks. Don't go check you know, news coverage. Your publicist will send you a rundown of that. But it's very tempting to get into a cycle where you're just continually looking for these refreshes because there might be something in there that's interesting. And so I often get a taste of just how quickly some of this stuff can become compulsion. And you bring up book launches. And it's so interesting that you've gained such popularity with all of your books without any social media platforms. It's such a status now. That's what people are going for. They're trying to get their likes up and their numbers up, their followers, so that they can get a book deal. So tell us about this experience, how you've done this without any social media. Well, the power of social media followings for book sales is largely overblown. I mean, if anything, what publishers are finding is, except for at the extremes, the sort of massive online personalities, things like Twitter followers don't convert to book sales very well. Actually, what's much more effective in terms of online community is email list. And this is actually what you get from publishers today is they'd much rather see a pretty large email list than they would a large Twitter following because email lists, they convert pretty high. Now, if you have a list of people who follow your writing, they'll buy your book. If you have 100,000 Twitter followers, very few of them actually will when you tweet out about the book. Also, I think what's become true in the publishing world and, and publishers increasingly understand this is that the real value of social media for book launches is that it allows other people to more easily spread the word about your book. There's only so much good you can do by saying, I have a new book out, I have a new book out, I have a new book out. Okay, that's okay. But the main thing is if there's a crowd that likes the book, their accounts is what allows them to spread it to other people. And so I think there's probably too much emphasis being placed in a lot of sectors right now on the idea that having a big social media following is somehow going to be crucial or like a huge advantage for some of these old fashioned activities that have been going on for a long time. So would you say your email list has been your biggest asset? I'm sure it has been helpful. I think it was helpful for the pre-launch. But the other thing that is true about getting big book sale numbers is that you can't make that happen. No one has a large enough list to, you know, if you're going to sell 400,000 copies of a book over a few years or something like that, most of that is going to come from the book being good and being spread, right? I mean, unless you have a 50 million person email list who loves you, the best you can do with something like my email list maybe helps seed the book out there. Maybe it helps the sales for the first week, uh, which is good for bestsellers list. And that's useful, but it's not going to make or break a book. The book is going to make or break itself, especially when you're talking about the type of sales numbers you need for something to be a big hit. Well, kind of goes back to your whole message analog is word of mouth, getting people to spread the word naturally, organically, probably you getting out in the community as well is probably what really helps. And that's what really resonates with people. I think that's absolutely right. You, You produce a product that is really good, produce a product that's too good to be ignored go to where people are and talk about it. That's useful. So I do a lot of podcast interviews, for example, because I think that's a good way for different audiences to really learn something about who I am and what I'm writing. 
there's only so much value you can get out of just telling your same audience again and again, hey, I have a book. You'll get X number of thousand that will buy it and that's nice, but that's it. And so if you want to keep going after that, it comes down to how good is the book and how willing are you to go where other people are and talk to them where they are. Makes a lot of sense to me, Cal. And the new book is titled Digital Minimalism. So I'll have you define that term. So digital minimalism is a philosophy of technology use that says you should focus your online activities on just a small number of tools that you have chosen because they give you large amounts of benefit. Okay. And I want to talk about this experiment that you did in winter 2018, where you ended up reaching out, I think it was to your email list, it must have been. And tell us about what you proposed and what the response was like. So i had been experimenting with something I call the digital declutter, which is now at the core of the book, which is a process for transforming into a digital minimalist. So for essentially starting from scratch with your online life, getting rid of all the stuff that you've haphazardly signed up for and downloaded and rebuilding your online life from scratch, but this time focusing on things very intentionally that are really valuable. So this process I was experimenting with have you step away from all of these optional technologies in your personal life for a month to get back in touch with what really matters. And then at the end of this whole month, you carefully rebuild your online life. So I put out a note to my email list and said, hey, is anyone willing to try this in January of 2018? My hope or idea at the time was maybe a dozen, maybe two dozen people, (laughs) because it was a big ask. I was like, maybe a couple dozen people will agree and I can talk to them and maybe I can hang out with them and see what it's like and it'll kind of be good research. So I put out this note to my list and over 1,600 people wrote back and said, yes, (laughs) yes, <laughs> you know, I'm doing this. It was a staggering response. And it really showed me how much hunger there was for people to get a change. But it also gave me a lot of insight into what happens when people from all sorts of different walks of life go through this relatively radical transformation of their digital behavior. And now we're going to take a quick break from our chat with Cal to give a shout out to our show partner, Spruce. Spruce is a company that is focused on amazing high-quality collagen powders, and they come in both marine and grass-fed bovine. What sets Spruce apart is that they really focus on sustainable sources, and they really make it really accessible to bring collagen in your day-to-day life. And collagen doesn't just have to be added into an elixir or a fancy smoothie, although that's a big way that I love to incorporate collagen, but it can also be added into water. And what Spruce has done is they have made these fun, enhanced packets that are really focused on skin, hair, joints, gut health, and they're blended with superfood ingredients like turmeric and ginger and green tea. And you can just open up these little packets, bring them with you on the go. Jesse and I have brought them with us when we travel to Bali. We brought them to Florida. They're great in the car or they're great just in your purse every day. If you haven't tried Spruce's quality collagen, I highly recommend you get your hands on it today. And super exciting news, Spruce is now available in the U.S. and worldwide, so people have more access to it now, which is amazing. But the bars are only available to our Canadian listeners. So go ahead and give Spruce a try. And as a listener of our show, you get 10% off all your Spruce purchases. To take advantage, go to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash spruce. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash spruce. And spruce is spelled S-P-R-O-O-S. Go and get yourself some spruce collagen today. You are going to love it. And now a shout out from other show partner, Organifi. Turmeric is such a big part of mine and Jesse's routine. We love to use it fresh in cooking, ground up in different elixirs or different baked goods that I'll make. And that's why I'm so excited that Organifi has a lineup of so many different turmeric-inspired products, like their gold drinks, which comes in plain and chocolate. But they also have straight-up turmeric capsules. And it is four times the strength of regular turmeric, and it comes infused with black pepper for good absorption. And one of the main benefits of turmeric is for pain and inflammation, and it helps to support your joints and digestion, and of course, overall health. And this product is such a big part of our daily routine now. We are putting the caps in along with our other supplements and taking it morning and night. So if you're looking to lower your inflammation and just get the benefits of turmeric, add these turmeric caps to your cart. This is such an incredible product, and you get an incredible deal as a listener of our show, 20% off. And to take advantage, all you need to do is go to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi, and Organifi ends in an I. Another great thing about the turmeric supplement is that it comes in dark glass. So it's an amazing product, amazing packaging, and we just love it. And now back to our chat with Cal.
Well, this is definitely a radical transformation. They're going from the regular habits to stopping everything cold turkey overnight. So when you were setting all this up, did you think about doing a more gradual method or what made you go for the cold turkey method? Well, the tips and tricks aren't working. This is something that became pretty clear early in my research on this topic is over the last couple of years where people have become quite uneasy about the current relationship with these tools, it's really a, a phenomenon of the last couple of years. There has been many, many articles and suggestions for how to take small steps. Turn off your notifications. Don't have the phone in your room. Do a digital Shabbat once a week where you have one day a week that you step away from your tools. Put your screen in the grayscale. This is a big one I hear a lot. You'll make your phone grayscale so it seems less enticing to look at. Lots of tips and tricks like this. Also lots of New Year's resolutions just to, in general, try to look at your phone less. In general, try to be a little bit more disconnected. So all of these gradual steps are being proposed and they weren't working. The forces were too powerful, both technologically and culturally, were just too powerful to draw you back for the screen. It was hard to have substantial change. And so I came to the belief that as in other areas in which, you know, in particular health and fitness, where change is difficult, sometimes you need something that's more extreme. You need a philosophy, something that's based in your value, something you can believe in, and something that allows you to consistently approach all these decisions you have to make. Just like in health and fitness, it's usually not enough just to say, hey, eat better or move more. It's a lot more effective when you have a whole philosophy that you can adopt wholesale, like, hey, I'm keto or I'm paleo or I'm vegan or whatever it is, right? And so digital minimalism is like the digital equivalent of going keto in some sense, right? Let's rip off the Band-Aid. Let's completely reform how we live this life. And let's do so on a foundation of our values. I think we need something that extreme if we're going to expect extreme changes to stick. Okay, so let's talk about ripping the Band-Aid off. What are people giving up for this 30 days? I know there's a lot of different variables out there like text messaging. Netflix, video games. Obviously, we're going to be getting rid of the different social media platforms, I assume. But let's let's talk about the details. So there's no one definitive list. But in general, what I say is if it's sort of a network technology that you use in your personal life that won't cause a major problem, if you step away from it for 30 days, then that should probably go on the list. So the obvious things are like social media, online news, games, These are sort of obvious sort of personal life digital activities that you could step away from for 30 days. Nothing that bad will happen. Then on the margins, we have things like streaming media. So I think it was obvious for everyone, don't go on YouTube, but Netflix was a little bit more complicated. And so some people kept Netflix. Some people got rid of it altogether. Some people had the rule that, okay, I'm only allowed to watch Netflix if I'm with someone else. So it could still be a part of social events like movie night but wasn't something that you could just binge on to try to escape from things in your life. Video games, like off your phone, but actual video games, even though they have very little to do with the internet. A lot of readers wrote in and said that should be on the list. That is taking up a lot of time. Text messaging, most people need to do some text messaging just for logistical reasons, but a lot of people put sort of fences around that during the 30 days. So they would say, I have my phone and do not disturb as its default mode. And then there's certain times where I check it specifically because there's a particular text I'm waiting for or I'm trying to arrange something logistically. So there's a little bit of creativity at the margins depending on your situation where some people allowed something, some people didn't, some people allowed it with some rules. But in the core, you had the sort of the typical activities that dominate a lot of our personal digital life. What I didn't cover, though, in this sort of abstention is work-related technologies. So you can't use my declutter as an excuse not to answer your boss's email for a month. That's a completely different issue, and it has completely different dynamics at play. So this is really about what's happening in your life outside of work. That makes a lot of sense. So what did people experience in the beginning going off this stuff cold turkey, and then later on over time as they got more used to it? Most people experienced a bit of a withdrawal type symptom for 5 to 15 days. So the compulsive urge to check something. And it was difficult not to have something to check. And so I wrote in the book, for example, of one young woman who took everything off her phone. But for the first 10 days, her urge to check the phone to get information was so strong that she was going to the weather app because it was the only thing on her phone that she could click on and had information that could change. So she was compulsively checking the weather app. And she said for about 10 days, she could tell you the weather in like 12 major cities around the world, an hour to hour level of granularity. But then that got better. So a lot of people had that sort of compulsive urge, it was difficult, and then it got better. What was more interesting for me to to discover, and this really broke down along age lines more than anything else, is that another issue people had was a real 
sense of dread or anxiety about what do I do with this time? I'm so used to, as soon as I have some free time, just escape. The screen, there's a stream of information. It's about me or it's algorithmically optimized. I can just sort of escape into it. And when you take that away, for some people, that was very scary. It was like staring into the existential void. For other people, it wasn't. And the difference seemed to be age. So people who were adults before the advent of social media and smartphones, they were essentially just going back to the types of things they used to do and were often just pleasantly surprised. Oh, I've forgotten how much I enjoyed doing X, Y, or Z. But for people who are a little bit younger, who don't have a memory of adult life before having ubiquitous access to this sort of passive algorithmically optimized stream, it was really scary. The question of it's me alone with my own thoughts and my time, and it's not at all obvious what I'm supposed to do. Well, that brings up an important point too, where part of the process, it seems to me to be successful with this detox is almost beforehand to plan out what I'm going to do with that extra time. Like, am I going to go and take up playing the guitar? Or am I going to go join a social club or go start working out in a workout class with a group of people? And actually planning that in, I see that as being an important part of the process. Well, now I recommend that because I I got this feedback so much, especially from people who are younger, is that even though this is not emphasized in the book, I now emphasize it in my public appearances. If you're worried about this, start adding back in analog high quality leisure now, well in advance of trying this detox, and it's going to be significantly less scary. It could be so anxiety producing for some people that it could derail the whole thing. And so I'm 100% on board with what you're suggesting. If you don't have a clear idea of what you would do If your whole afternoon was free and you had no phone, the declutter is going to be scary. So start working on that now. And as you say, pick up some hobbies, join some things, sign up for some things, start learning some new skills, start getting involved in your community, connecting more with friends and family, you know, start putting that in place. You won't find the declutter process be nearly as difficult if that's already there. And even at the most basic level, people need to learn how to spend time alone and by themselves and be with their thoughts. I think that is often the most feared thing for a lot of people who are constantly connected. Now we're seeing people going for walks with their device in hand or going for a run or being with their kids. So let's talk about what people are missing out on by just not having that solo time to themselves. This was an interesting discovery that solitude, which is just time alone with your own thoughts, is really, really important. Let's say 10 years ago or before, this would be sort of a crazy thing to even bother emphasizing because time alone with your own thoughts was something that just happened every day naturally. There's just lots of occurrences throughout normal human existence where you are alone with your own thoughts when you're waiting in line at the store, when you're commuting to work and you don't like what's on the radio that morning, when you're walking the dog, even in the bathroom, right? In the shower. There's often times, maybe not really long, but just, yeah, all the time we are alone with our own thoughts as a kid going on the road trips, all this type of thing. Smartphones and ubiquitous high-speed internet access for the first time in human history has made it possible to try to banish every last moment of solitude because in every single situation, you can do a quick glance at a screen that'll give you nice stimuli that's going to catch your attention and prevent you from having to be alone with your own thoughts. This is really dangerous. We lose a lot when we lose regular moments of solitude. Just from a mental health perspective, when you are processing input from another mind, so you're reading something or listening to something, That's all hands on deck in your brain, right? Our brain takes that very seriously. Okay, I am processing input from another mind. I have to use a lot of resources to try to understand who is conveying this. What does it mean? What does it tell me about my current standing in the social world? And it uses a lot of resources to do this. So if you are constantly filling in every moment, looking at inputs generated from other minds, it exhausts the brain. It causes anxiety, which is why I think so many of us just have this low background hum of anxiety, which has just become ubiquitous and we think is just unavoidable, but is really actually just our brain saying, hey, I need some downtime. But you also miss out on some crucial self-development and professional development because time alone with your own thoughts is when you can have professional insights. Time alone with your own thoughts is where you can figure out your life and have character or personal insights about who you are, what you're about, or what's important to you. All of these type of cognitive leaps of understanding just require your brain to be a little bit bored, just sifting around through things, trying to push things in a different structure, see what fits, see what clicks. If you take that all out of your life, it really impoverishes your daily experience. And this was definitely really important for me reading the book coming across this because I'm somebody who does go for a lot of walks, but I'm always plugging a podcast in and taking in information during that time. And I'm somebody who does take a lot of time to be by myself and read a book. But again, there's always this ongoing information coming in. So one of my key takeaways from reading your book is definitely to create that time of solitude 
And, you know, maybe half the time when I go for a walk, go, you know, with nothing in my ears and just being with nature. Yeah, that's exactly right. So you don't need to be in solitude all day long. If you're in solitude all day long, you're also going to be very lonely and miserable. But just having these regular experiences, like I'm going to the drugstore, maybe this time I'm not bringing my phone, or I'm going hiking in nature. Yeah, maybe for the first 20 minutes, there's no earbuds in. And then maybe for the second 20 minutes, I'm going to listen to a podcast. So it's just about having it on a regular basis. It doesn't have to be that long. It doesn't have to be all the time, but it should be pretty regular. Okay. And we've talked about a couple of these strategies you talk about in the book. You just mentioned leaving the phone at home. And we talked about going for a walk and again, having that time with the earbuds out. Another thing you mentioned in the book is journaling. And I'd love for you to tell us about your journaling practice and using Moleskine notebooks over the years. So I've been using Moleskine notebooks since 2004. And I still have my, going all the way back to my original Moleskine notebook, I have this big pile of them. I use them for personal reflection. So when I have ideas about my life, my values, like sort of non-professional self-reflection, I work it out in these Moleskine journals. And then then when I fill it, I sort of go through and say what's actually really worth thinking about or not. And there's kind of a whole ritual around that. But what's more important than actually reviewing my thoughts is the process of writing it down in the first place. You know, so this is an act of solitude. So if you really want to structure your solitude, get really good at being alone with your own thoughts and extracting value from it, writing to yourself. So in a journal or writing yourself a letter, but just the act of writing itself allows you to start putting structure to the thoughts that are just bouncing around in your head, which is an act of self-reflection and solitude that can be really important. I talk about in the book about how a lot of famous historical figures used to do this. And it just really helped them make sense of their life, what's going on, particular issues, what they want to do. The act of writing is a way of sitting alone with yourself and making sense of what's bouncing around in your head as opposed to perhaps just letting it overwhelm you. And a group of people you talk about in the book is the Amish. And in general, I think the popular understanding of this group is that they're this group of people who are frozen in time and they're not about adopting the new tools that are being created and being part of all the new creations of the 21st century. So in writing the book, in doing this research and putting it together, what did you learn about them? So that popular image that the Amish just froze their technology at some point in the distance path is inaccurate. If you spend time around the old order Amish, you're going to see an eclectic mixture of old and new technology. So yeah, you might see the horse and buggy, but you also might see solar panels. They're wearing old clothes, but the Amish child might come by on rollerblades. There'll be generators. There's telephones that they use. I talk about a Mennonite family that has a $250,000 $250,000 computer controlled CNC router, and their daughter wearing a bonnet is operating it. And so, what's going on in these communities? Well, what they're actually doing is applying an ethic of intentionality to their technology. So, for the Amish, their number one value is the strength of the community. That's what they care most about. And so, when a new technology comes along, the way they evaluate it is they say, is this going to strengthen or weaken the community? And if it's going to strengthen the community, then we can allow it. If it's going to weaken the community, then we're not going to allow it, which is why solar panels are okay. It doesn't weaken the community, but they're worried about being connected to the electrical grid because it feels like now you're connected to an organization outside the community. You're kind of part of a broader network, and they worry that that would weaken the bonds. They often use tractors, but they really are suspicious of automobiles because when they experimented with automobiles, people would leave the village. You know, hey, I have a car. I'm going to go somewhere and go somewhere else. I'm going to go to the mall or whatever. They thought that hurt the strength of the community. So they're just very intentional. But the reason why I think they're important is that what they demonstrate is intentionality itself can be significantly more important than convenience. And so the Old order Amish lifestyle is incredibly inconvenient because of all of these technologies that they've decided not to use. It would be a huge pain for you and I to shift tomorrow into an Amish existence. And yet they still exist and are still thriving, even though they are on the eastern seaboard of the United States of America, right? They're surrounded by consumerist civilization. They're not isolated on some island. They all go for a year of rum springa when they're young and are given the opportunity to remain on the outside. So it's not like they don't know what's going on. And yet these communities still persist. And it's because the value they get from being intentional just far outweighs what's lost from the inconveniences that go along with those decisions. And so that's crucial for understanding why minimalists in general 
tend to feel happy and satisfied. So if you're a digital minimalist and you're just using a few key technologies to give you big wins, that means you're ignoring a lot of other things, a lot of other services that maybe could give you little small wins. But you're a minimalist, so you say, I don't care about the small wins. I just do the things to give me the big wins. So you're losing lots of little bits of value and convenience. But what we learned from the Amish is that's probably okay because the value you're going to feel for being so intentional about your technology use is going to far outweigh the inconvenience of, hey, if I don't use Facebook, I might not know when my friend's birthdays are or whatever it is. That intentionality is very important to humans. Convenience, we adjust to. And this makes me think of organizations or people who are entrepreneurs and use social media and a lot of these platforms for business. How can they start to integrate and approach these platforms in a healthy, productive way so it's not consuming them every hour of the day? So if you're going to use social media professionally, use social media like a professional. That's usually the advice I give. So first of all, be really clear and backed up by experience and research about what activities really move the needle. Don't fall into the trap of just, I want to do a lot of activity online, just be really busy online because roughly speaking, I hope that this freneticism alchemizes into success. No, no, be really specific. What is actually important in this sector? What actually moves the needle on my business and what doesn't? So that you can focus in on verified, empirically verified, important activities. Once you know what those activities are, make a plan for it. Here's when I do it. Here's how I do it. I have a schedule of posting. Social media professionals almost never access it on their phone. The phone is about helping the stock price of the social media companies. The desktop, that's about, oh, I'm a savvy business owner who's making use of some of these technologies. So you use it on your desktop. You're not using it on your phone. You have some schedule or some system. A lot of people I know hire other people to do a lot of this work for them because it's something that could be easily outsourced. And maybe it's once a day or once every other day for 20 minutes, you log on and do X, Y, Z or whatever it is, and that's it. And so its footprint in your life is small, but you're trying to extract as much value as you can out of it. The thing to avoid is to just instead allow the fact that social media might, in some vague sense, be good for your business, be an excuse to be looking at your phone all day long right? That's sort of amateur hour. So I say, that's why I actually profile social media professionals in the book. If you need it for professional uses, use it like a professional. Now we're going to take another quick break from our chat with Cal to give a shout out to our show partner, Perfect Keto. You've heard me talk about how much I love the MCT oil powder from Perfect Keto. And lately I've been hooked on the chocolate flavor. And I've been putting this into an afternoon hot chocolate that I've been making with coconut milk, coconut butter, collagen, and cacao, and of course, adding a scoop of this collagen MCT oil powder. It makes it so creamy, so thick, it's so good, and it's nice to know that you can have a hot chocolate without any dairy or loaded with sugar and with actually real cacao. So if you want to make a tasty version of your own hot chocolate, get yourselves a tub or two of the MCT oil powder and chocolate. And as a listener of our show, you get 20% off your first Perfect Keto purchase, so make it a good one. To take advantage, go to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash perfectketo. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash perfectketo. These products ship worldwide, free shipping in the US. Go and load up on the chocolate MCT oil powder today. And now a shout out from other show partner, Sun Warrior. Guess what? Sun Warrior has been innovating behind the scenes and they've just come out with a plant-based collagen building protein peptides. For those of you who are living a vegan or vegetarian lifestyle, now you can get the support of nutrients to help your body make its own collagen. And this amazing blend has some powerful ingredients which include hyaluronic acid, biotin, kale and spinach, vitamin C, tremella mushroom, silica, spirulina, and peptides from rice. So if you've been wanting to get on the collagen train, but you haven't been able to because you are vegetarian or vegan and there hasn't been a product available to you, Sun Warrior has made this easy and it's going to help your body facilitate its own collagen and it comes in vanilla and chocolate. So get your hands on this amazing product. And as the listener of our show, you get 20% off all your Sun Warrior purchases. To take advantage, go to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Sun Warrior. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Sun Warrior. Added bonus, if you spend $50 or more, you get free shipping. Go and try out the collagen building protein peptides today. This is a fantastic product. And now back to our chat with Cal. And the one platform that has me curious is Instagram. You know, for people who are maybe trying to take that digital detox and eliminate it, because that one is mainly used on the phone, how can we approach Instagram in a healthy way? 
Well, for example, I met quite a few visual artists when I was looking on the book who explained to me the importance of Instagram for what they do. I mean, it turns out if you're going to do visual art, you need creative inputs. You have to see what other really creative artists in your style are doing, because this is essentially the grist or the fuel that you transform into your own creative insights. You have to look at a lot of art to produce interesting new art, which is why until recently, if you wanted to be a successful artist, you had to live in one of a small number of cities that happened to have a big gallery scene. So for them, Instagram has been this sort of miracle democratizing force because now it doesn't matter where you live, you can actually expose yourself to art and progress from people that you admire. And and this allows you to have creative insight yourself. And so visual artists have told me Instagram is key in a way that for me, I have no need for Instagram. But when they go through this digital minimalist process, which has you focus on the tools that are really important, and then, and this is key, ask yourself how and when I should use this tool to get the most value out of it. A lot of them realized looking at my phone all the time is not the healthiest way to get this particular value out of Instagram. So some of the visual artists I talk to have a once a week schedule. They have pruned down who they follow to around 10 artists that they find to be particularly inspirational. They do log in on their computer if possible, and they do it, let's say Sunday night. Okay. What have they worked on this week? It takes me 20 minutes. I have 10 people I follow. I can see their work, boom, inspiration, and I'm done. Those type of fences around behavior are pretty common once people go through this digital minimalist transition process. And I'm trying to relate it as someone who's a foodie and a nutritionist, my thing is food. So I'm constantly posting food, looking at other people's food. So I'm trying to kind of mirror that to my situation, how, or a lot of people, because food is really big on Instagram, that tends to be, I'm sure, just like art, tends to be one of the big reasons why people are using it. So any advice for people who are foodies, how they can consume this in a healthy way? Curate who you follow down to sort of high quality, people whose content is really important, high quality to you, and then have a schedule. And so maybe one hour every other night and do it on your desktop. And if you're also posting, then maybe it's 20 minutes every night, you put your photos online and maybe every other night you do whatever, a longer read of what's going on. You'll get 98% of the value on that schedule. But what you're avoiding is the huge opportunity cost and mental drain of looking at the Instagram on your phone all the time as an escape from everything else that's going on in your life. And so a schedule like that for a lot of people, if it's really important, part of your business, posting about food, knowing what other people are doing, 20 minutes a night, maybe once or twice a week, a slightly longer thing on your desktop, same time on a schedule. Something like that is probably the right way to approach the tool. And Cal, for somebody who is cutting back and they're going to try out maybe what you just said, how do they get over the fear of missing out? When we're so used to, you know, being connected to our family, our friends, a lot of times strangers too now in the growing social media world. But, you know, we're so used to just seeing all these different people on a regular basis and, and seeing what's happening in their lives. I'm sure FOMO has got to be an issue for a lot of people. So how do we start going about getting over that? Well, the core idea behind minimalism is that focusing on what you know for sure is really important to you is going to make you much happier than trying to make sure that you don't lose little small bits of value. So minimalists don't fear on missing out on the unknown. They fear instead not spending enough time on the things they already know for sure are really important to them. And so if you want to have strong relationships, actually go sacrifice time and attention on behalf of family, close friends, and your community. You're going to feel very connected. You know, if you want to be involved in interesting things, then get involved in a small number of interesting things in, let's say, your community that expose you to interesting people and ideas. And don't worry about that there might be other interesting people and ideas you aren't meeting. It doesn't add up. You just want some interesting people and ideas in your life. Get activities that give you a lot of value. I mean, double down on the things you know for sure are important. And you are going to end up better off than taking that same energy and dissipating it in the sort of constant search for little nuggets of value or interestingness that you might be missing. That's the key idea of minimalism. It doesn't just apply to your digital life. It applies to clutter in your house. It applies to your career. Marcus Aurelius talked about this. Thoreau talked about this. It's an age-old idea. And everywhere you apply it, it comes back to the same principles. Focus on the things that are really important. Ignore the things that are kind of important. You will end up better off. And it's proven to be true over millennia of human experience. And it will continue to be true even after you step away from some of these incredibly recent technological innovations. Well, it makes a lot of sense to me. And definitely your book had a profound effect on me. I've already done things like deleted the email off my phone. And I've taken most of the social media off my phone. I still have Instagram on there. I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do with that. 
But what about for the person out there that's listening to this? And again, like myself, they're on board, they're going to give this a whirl, and maybe they're going to do your 30-day detox. But what about the parents out there uh, with kids that are, you know, at that age where they're starting to get smartphones and starting to be more connected? I know you actually have a few kids yourself. I think they're still a bit younger, so they're probably not at this point yet. But what do you say to parents out there who are, you know, becoming aware and they want to protect their kids? Well, my current read of the research literature is don't give someone in young adolescence a smartphone. Start with that as the foundation and then work backwards to figure out what do I have to do to make that work. I'm not saying that it's easy, but what I am saying is that the research is becoming increasingly clear. The adolescent brain really cannot handle ubiquitous access to social media platforms on a smartphone. And so deal with the social consequences. We'll have to deal with it. What does this mean? (laughs) What's it going to mean for your kid? What's it going to mean for their social life? Yeah, it's really hard. But I'm getting pretty scared by the literature I'm seeing about what happens when you give, let's say, a 13-year-old access to Snapchat and a smartphone that they have with them at all times. It's not good. Well, tell us about that. Well, so one of the main things that demographers have noticed is that there was this giant increase in anxiety and anxiety-related disorders. And so they go back and they look at when did this increase happen, and they start trying to correlate, well, what else was happening in the world at the time of these increases? They really, this is how you do correlational epidemiological research, is that you measure a signal, and then you try the best you can to understand what was causing this. So there was a lot of hypotheses being thrown around, but they started falling off one by one. So people thought, well, maybe it's sort of economic anxiety because there was the Great Recession. That doesn't quite fit because the rise in anxiety came well after the worst of the recession. So then other people said, well, maybe it's political anxiety in the sort of Trump era. Maybe people are sensing sort of political stress at home and that's making kids more anxious. Well, that doesn't fit because the rise happened before that period. And so there's sort of these efforts to try to understand. Then someone said, well, maybe it's self-reporting, right? Maybe just around that time, we got more comfortable talking about mental health. And so it's not that there's more anxiety, it's just that young people are more willing to describe themselves as anxious. But that didn't quite fit because hospitalizations for self-harm and suicide went up right along with the anxiety, right? So it's not just self-reporting. There is one thing that fits the timing perfectly. Right around the time where access to smartphones among adolescents went from a small fraction to nearly ubiquitous, that's when the numbers jumped up. When it went from like 40% to 85%, that's exactly the point where anxiety, anxiety anxiety-related disorders just really jumped off the charts. Now, of course, it is correlational. There could be something else, right? Maybe there's something we don't know about. Maybe this is at the same time that, you know, some new type of food dye was used in Starburst or something like that. And that's what's making people more anxious. But we have one other bit of information, which is usually very helpful in correlational connections, is what's actually happening in the cultural discussion. And when you talk to teenagers, they will tell you directly, being on social media on my phone is incredibly stressful and makes me anxious. (laughs) They know that's the problem. They're identifying that's the problem. And then you look at the data and you say, well, it does match that. You're right. As soon as you guys got access to these the anxiety and anxiety related disorders went way up. So, you know, it's not a perspective study. It's not a causal study. Those are very hard to do. But this is about as clear as you can get with some of these large scale epidemiological type research endeavors. It's about as clear as you can get. Smartphones and the social media of the smartphones in particular is really dangerous for the mental health of teenagers. And is there an age range now that is given statistically as to when kids are getting phones? Well, I think just culturally speaking, like in America, it's when kids get around like 12 to 14 years old, sort of this middle school into high school is when it's kind of standard. Right. I'm just trying to think back to when I got my phone. I think I was in probably late high school and the phone then was not like the phone now. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about what smartphones even originally were intended for and where they've come to now. Well, this is an important thing to emphasize that if we think about, let's say, the iPhone, which I think is a good place to start. There are smartphones before the iPhone, but the iPhone was the first sort of non-business related smartphone. So the first smartphone that was aimed at consumers for personal use, not as like a BlackBerry or something, which was aimed for professional uses. And when the iPhone was launched, the idea was that it was going to take some things that people already really enjoyed doing and make those experiences even better. This was typical Steve Jobs minimalism. Take things that people love, make the experience even more beautiful. And so I went back and talked to one of the original engineers for the original iPhone launch. And as he explained to me, that original iPhone was meant to be a really, really good iPod and a really, really good phone that's packaged together so you don't need two devices in your pocket. 
And this was essentially more or less how we saw consumer-facing smartphones when they first came out. They were tools that did a limited number of things really, really well and really beautifully. And so it made people really happy. It is really nice to check or make a call on an iPhone versus an old smartphone. The music player on this is great. I can flick through the album covers or that cover flow. I can flick through the covers. And if someone calls, the music stops. And then when the call ends, the music starts again. Classic Jobsian sort of beautiful experience minimalism. The idea that we look at our phone all the time, that came later. And that was the social media companies who drove this idea that if we can make our products really addictive, we can get people to look at their phones all the time. That's going to make us a lot of money. And so there is nothing fundamental to the technology that says we need to be looking at them all the time. That is an entirely contrived behavior that has nothing to do with getting the most value out of this tech. And to me, that's one of the most important points I came across in my research. This constant companion model where we're always looking at our phone, that is incredibly arbitrary. It was invented to serve the bottom lines of a small number of companies. It has nothing to do with being high tech. It has nothing to do with getting the value out of this technology. It's more exploitative than it is productive or high tech or forward thinking. And so if we're going to push back on anything, and digital minimalists really love to push back on this, is this idea that you need to be like an air traffic controller always looking at the screen. That's not high tech. That's just you clocking in your shift at the social media money-making factory. And it's interesting, Cal, there is this whole movement that's actually gaining a lot of steam right now of going back to quote unquote dumb phones or flip phones. So talk about that a little bit. Well, I, people are getting fed up with this constant companion model. And so one way to push back is to say, great, I'll just go to a phone that literally cannot have those things on it. So I can make phone calls, I can text message. And that is picking up steam. And I got to tell you, the people who do it, and I meet a lot of them at my events, they tell you it's a huge weight off their shoulders. I'll ask them, well, what if you need to look up directions? And they're like, I don't know, I print them out. Like, okay, <laughs> like that's kind of a pain. But let me tell you, like I'm out doing things, there's nothing for me to check. And it completely changes sort of their experience of the world. Now, I don't think you have to necessarily go to a dumb phone to do that. I just suggest dumbing down your smartphone. I like looking up directions. I like listening to the music features on my phone. But just take off all of the apps in which someone makes money every time you click on it. Get rid of all the social media, the games, the streaming news. Get that all off the phone. Just make the phone back to. It's a great phone. You can look up directions, you can listen to music, and there's a web browser there if you need, for example, to get some information on the fly, like, oh, what are the hours for this museum I'm going to? If you dumb down your smartphone to be more like the original Steve Jobs vision was, it goes back to being like this very nice object that does a few things really well when you need it, but doesn't have a large presence in your daily life. And I love that we're talking about this. This whole conversation is about the behavior and the habits around using our phone. And Jesse and I have done a few podcasts on the impact of the EMFs and that whole aspect of what the phone and the device is doing. So it's so interesting from these two angles, it's just showing us that this tool that we all have on us every day is affecting us physiologically, psychologically, and in so many different ways. But I'm curious, have you ever addressed any of the EMF stuff too in any of your research? I don't know a lot about it yet, but I do know that it has transitioned. It seems like it has transitioned in recent years from something that seemed fringe to something that now people are casting a wary eye on is, wait a second. But more generally, I think what's not surprising here is that anytime you take something as finely tuned as the human body and the human mind and human psychology, and you make very rapid and radical changes to sort of how it goes about its business, bad things happen. And so, okay, we're going to now have a piece of transmitting electronic device you know, near us all the time. Hey, bad things could happen. Or we're going to take something that's really, really ancient, like human social dynamics, and we're going to monkey around with it, with apps that teenagers came up with in dorm rooms. Something bad's going to happen, right? You know, we're, going to, we're going to look at screens all day long while algorithms feed us stuff that models say is going to get us engaged something bad is going to happen. I mean, anytime, it's just like what happened when we messed around with food in the mid 20th century and said, hey, we can process food and make it highly palatable and really convenient. This is great. And then whoops, we get the obesity epidemic. You mess around with deeply human things. You radically change sort of the rhythms, the ancient rhythms of human life, all sorts of unintended consequences occur. And so I think there's just a huge cascade of unintentional consequences that are happening as these tools from Silicon Valley are trying to make these radical changes to what our daily life is like. And in the end, the net effect is the same. Whether we reduce our use or limit our exposure to it, we're going to bring us back to our primal nature, get back out in nature and get back connected with different people and feel what we're supposed to feel like. So this is a great way to wrap up. Before we do that, I do want to ask you, 
What does ultimate health mean to you? So I like the Greek notion of eudaimonia, which is human flourishing. So actually reaching the full potential you have as a human in your life in terms of everything from how you feel, what you do, your body, your relationships, your body of work, your experience of the world, just pushing the capacity of human experiences to its full potential. And, you know, Aristotle identified that as the goal of human life, more important than just happiness. And I think that's right. That ultimate health is about living the ultimate human experience. And that absolutely requires you to step back and to get intentional. What matters? How do I shape my life around that? And then confidently step away from everything else. Love that, Cal. And the new book is Digital Minimalism. We highly recommend the listeners get a copy of this. And normally we'd ask how the listeners can connect with you after the show, but I know you're not on social. So other than jumping on your email list, checking out your blog, anything else you want to put out for the listeners? So I am a blog nerd on calnewport.com. I've been blogging for over a decade, so you can read a lot about this. There is an email address there that if there's like an interesting article or interview you think I should know about, you can send it my way. But yeah, other than that, if you want to connect to me, I guess yell my name real loud next time you're in Washington, D.C., maybe I'll hear you. But <laughs> otherwise, I'll probably be just walking the streets of my town, you know, thinking deep thoughts, talking to my friends. And I think that's okay. All right, Cal, this was a lot of fun. This message is so important, and we're just so excited to bring it to the listeners. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Cal. Thank you, Cal. I absolutely love this conversation with Cal. So much great information. Hopefully, you took a lot away from today. So as you know, you will not find Cal over on social media. So what we're asking you to do today is join us over in our Facebook group. This is our community, which we think is very intentional as this is a place where we can have our listeners from all over the world come together, ask questions and engage with one another. So come on over to ultimatehealthpodcast.com forward slash community and let us know what you think of today's episode. For full show notes, be sure and head over to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash 286. We're going to have links there to everything we discussed in a nice show summary. So be sure and check that out. And before we let you go, I want to give some love to our editor and engineer, Jay Sanderson over at podcasttech.com. Jay, thanks for doing such a great job putting the show together. And this week's fun fact about Jace is that he's been looking forward to the spring sunshine. Well, Jace, we're officially in spring now. Hopefully the sun has been shining for you over in Prague. Have an awesome week. We'll talk soon. Take care.